Well, we had an exciting day of Go Warriors. Uh, had our class going today. I did not get a chance to go home and change. Here I am. So we've been we've been tearing it up, going after building the kingdom all day long, and here we are. So come as we are. I do want to um, read some scripture real quick out of Ephesians 4. We're going to receive the offering real fast as well. Uh, and then we got a special message from Doc Barkley sent from headquarters here that we're going to show. So Ephesians 4, verse 1 says, Therefore I, a prisoner, for serving the Lord, beg you to live a, lead a life worthy of your calling. We need to understand that we have been called and predestined in Christ to do a specific thing. You function in the body. You have a purpose. Amen. <clears throat> so, so I beg you. To lead the life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. That's not speaking to anybody individually. It's talking to the church at large. You've been called. Always be humble. Always be gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowances for each other's faults because of love. <laughs> Verse 3, make every effort. So again, who is he talking to? Say me. <laughs> He's talking to me. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So regardless of how somebody may or may not have done you wrong, regardless of sins that they may have had or have not in their past, you have a responsibility to make every effort on your part to make sure unity is happening in the body of Christ. As much as depends on you, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called together in one glorious hope for the future. We have a, a phrase we use around here a lot. It's not just some coin phrase. We really do believe it. We are stronger together. And so if there's division, listen, if that's kind of like our motto, I don't know how you want to, what you want to tag you want to put on that. What's the devil trying to do then? Divide us. If we're stronger together, his number one plan and purpose then is to divide us to conquer us. Right? So we gotta be we gotta wake up, pull our head out of the sand, and understand what our enemy is actually trying to do, be aware of it, and fight against it. All that starts in your brain. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, verse five. Verse six, one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. And it talks about Jesus ascending and descending. I'm not just skipping up for no reason. I'm just trying to get somewhere, right? Verse 10, verse 11. Now these are the gifts. Everybody say gift. Everybody loves Christmas time because we love giving gifts. We love receiving gifts, right? This is a gift that is like the gift of all gifts. One of the gifts from our Father, right? And there's many from our Father. Um, you know, in marriage counseling with younger people and things like that who are about to get married, we always say, man, you're going to receive some gifts on your wedding day, but your best gift is going to come from your Heavenly Father. Yeah. Right? And it's a gift that's going to keep on giving through the course of your marriage. These are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. Say, oh, that's me. So to the church, God himself gave me a gift. Woo. I can't wait. Let's see. Here it is. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, teacher. If that's the case, why is it that we're not receiving these gifts? Now, I have these gifts over my life as well, so I'm speaking to me, me too. I have a pastor over my life. I have apostles over my life. We've been drilling this in our, in our school this week because we do, we do chapel every morning at 8.30. So we, we've been tearing apart the Word of God and kind of defining what is a warrior, right? So we're cornerstone warriors. So we've kind of been defining in the morning before we start every day what exactly is a warrior. We're defining a lot of that from Proverbs. But one of the main things that we've been drilling into these students is that you have, you have a gift. You have gifts that God himself has given you. And you need to receive those gifts if you're going to be what you're supposed to be. In order for you to be what you're supposed to be, you need to receive these gifts. And so, again, talking to students, that means right now Jen's back with, Pastor Jen is back with, with students in a classroom. 
So I speak into that age group. Hey, listen, when you're back in that class, you need to receive that woman who has given you instruction as a pastor of this church, a pastor of your life who is equipping you to be all that you're called to be. This is not all about just me here. When we're talking about the gifts of God, I may be the apostle. I may be the one who was sent here to get this thing done and going. But this is not a one-man show here. We have pastor teachers in the house like Matthew Wagner and, and his mom, Brenda Wagner. We have prophets in the house like, like Chuck Wagner, right? You understand? We have evangelists that, that we're, we're equipping, we're building. We have youth pastors that are set in place to, for specific groups, children's pastors, Right? that are all, all have a part to play in equipping this body. With that being said, we even have those giftings that are outside of this body, one of them being Dr. Barclay, who is the overseer of this whole thing. Jesus Christ is the head of church, don't get me wrong. I'm saying that Doc Barclay's ministry is like our umbrella, right? Uh, it used to be Doc Lemon was one of those until he passed away. The Lord, the Lord is developing some relationships with some other men right now that I think could be raised up in, in an outside one of those giftings as well. But what is the point? Their responsibility, according to verse 12, is to equip God's people to do the work of the kingdom, to build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue, meaning we got a lot of work to do, it's going to keep going, keep equipping, keep building the body of Christ, verse 13, until what? Until we all come into the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, that we will be mature in the Lord, no longer being babies, measuring up into the full and complete standard of Jesus Christ. Then the next verse says we will no longer be immature. There's two, two Greek words there that you really need to dig into. It's huios and technon. Huios and Technon, you don't want to be that immature believer in Jesus Christ. You want to progress into the mature believer of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what this is talking about. That mature believer in Jesus Christ is no longer going to be tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine, every wind and wave of new teaching. Listen, we're, come, we're in the last of the last days. According to the Word of God, deception is going to run wild in these days. And you need to be a mature believer who's not going to get tripped, tripped up with false teaching. Amen. Man, that's a good spot. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth, but instead, verse 15, I think it says, we will speak the truth in love. Hmm. Speak the truth in love. Growing, growing insinuates that you're not perfect. You got some place to go to. Right? And in order for you, for you to get to this place that you need to go to, there's the, the, the equipping there from the gifts that Jesus Christ gave you in order for you to get there. Not be influenced. Instead, speak the truth in love, growing in every way to be more like Christ. That's the goal. Who is the head of this body? The church. That's our goal, is to every day get up more with the ambition of being more and more and more like Jesus every day. I don't care what happened yesterday. His mercies are new every morning. We're going to get up today. No matter what we missed yesterday, we're going to press forward. We're going to get past it. We're going to repent. We're going to move on, and we're going to be more like Jesus today. And tomorrow, we're going to do the same thing all over again. We're going to get up, and we're going to say, Yes, sir, I am yours to command in all things. Help me to die to myself and be more like you in everything. Right? This is just the Bible. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing to be more and more like Christ, who is the head of the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each one does its own special work. Oh, we all have a job to do. And when we do, it says it helps the other parts grow. So that means that when you're tripped up, messed up in your mind, off on some false thing, got some problem with somebody else in the body of Christ, you're causing all of us to not grow. Am I reading into it, or is that what it says? That when we're doing our part, fit together perfectly in Jesus Christ, and we're all doing our own special work, you're called to be a hand, you're called to be a foot, you're called to be a lung, you're called to be a in the body of Christ. When we're all firing on all cylinders, 
then we're growing. Isn't that what it said a few verses ago? We should be growing. That's the whole purpose, to be more and more like Christ so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of hate. Oh, I got it wrong? What's it say? Full of love. That was a trick, huh? (laughs) Healthy and growing and full of love. This is what the body of Christ should look like. So if it doesn't, we should have some questions going on in our mind. If this is not what the body of Christ looks like, we better fix it quick. But we've got gifts that have been set in place to help us do it. So in order for you to be equipped and get over what's hanging you up, you need to recognize authority, and you need to recognize the gift that God has placed over your life. And when they come to you and say, listen, I love you, brother. I think this might be off a little bit. I love you. I'm going to walk with you. But look, at this is what it says. This this is not my opinion. The Bible's got to be the final authority in all things. So it doesn't matter what you and me think. It's what does this say? And so if I'm examining your life, and according to this, it seems like maybe, just maybe, we need to tweak just this a little bit. So again, you're you're never going to be what you're supposed to be until you learn to receive the gift that's been placed over your life who's called to do that. Who's called to do that. This is not not a relationship that you have (laughs) with just every Joe Blow around the planet. There's people in authority over your life that can actually, that have authority from Jesus to actually speak to you that way. And not not talking about mean, just equipping you and instructing you from the Word of God, exhorting you from the Word of God. Man, you are doing awesome. Can you tweak this? Man, you're doing awesome. Can you just tweak this one thing here so we can go further? And I want to share it because it goes right into this. Is so the vision was really um, different because it was talking about the offering and about how God is an all-giving. All of these gifts that we get, he is an all-giving God, and he gives it freely. But the problem that we're getting held up in is he showed me very clearly is if it fits into us and we're going to get something from it, then to this month, week I'm going to give my offering or I'm going to give a top, my tithes and I'm going to give an offering Because I really need that new car, or I really need that. But then next week, I don't really need that, and I really don't like what they're doing with it at the church. (laughs) I don't like what they're doing with it at the church. They're spent it on here. Well, this is what God said. Once you give that gift, I'm going to take this gift. I'm going to give this to Caleb. Caleb, that is for you. Now, if Caleb goes and spends that on a candy bar that is not good for him, it's none of my business. Because I gave that to him as a gift. When you put your gift in to God, to the church, it's no longer your business. That is God's money to do what God wants to do with it. And if it don't get spent the way it's supposed to do, it isn't your cross to bear. You've got to let it go. I had this complete vision of it. I didn't know why. And I thought, oh, gosh, he's going to tell me to do offering. Well, it just fit into your plan. And that is where we're getting hung up. He is an all-giving God. But we have to do our part to be an all-giving person back. We have to give not just because it's going to convenient us this week. Next week it might not be so convenient, but guess what? God already knows that thought. He already knows that game before you even thought of it. So you need to be participant and give it every week to know to, or you're not going to get what God has for you, plain and simple. Give it and let it go. Now, I was trying to figure out how I was going to tie that all back into offering, so Leah pulled it in for me. Because I wasn't really talking about offering at all. I was just giving you some principles from the Word of God, but she's right. But part of the body of Christ. And I say, well, I'm really busy this week. I, can't, I can help you next week. Well, by next week, he's already in a crisis mode because I was too busy. Yeah. Because it, better, it, better, it wouldn't better me this week. So it, it's about not just offering. It's about everything. God just showed me that when you give your time, it's not to go complain to, oh, I had to go back to the church another day. 
You know, it's when you give your time or if you went and bought something for the church, it ain't to go and tell everybody. It's you bless that with God. If you bless them with your time, you bless them with money, whatever it is, that's what it's about. Let it go. It's out of your hands. You did it for God. If you're saying, I want rewarded for it now, basically what you're saying is, I want what I can get. It don't matter what you really want. That's it. You're looking for a reward from man. You already got it. But what, what, what we're after is reward in heaven. And Yeah, and so when we give from a clean heart, pure heart, and we're, we're just looking to glorify Jesus in what we're doing, then there's reward in heaven. If you're chasing after accolades of man, then you've already got them here, and what are they really worth? Yeah, whoo. <laughs> so I really do need to get this video rolling. I'm just going to say this, too. You know, we seem to have a, a real easy letting go of, you know, she gave him a dollar. It, it, we, we don't have any problem, seems like, letting go of when it's a small amount. But when God really begins to bless you and the tithe and the offering becomes larger amounts, it seems like then that's when people have a harder time of letting go. Well, what are you going to do with this if I give you this much money? Well, you didn't have nothing before you got all that money. What are you complaining about? I'm going to pray and start the video now. Now, we're streaming this from YouTube. So hopefully we don't have internet problems. I'll just make that little note ahead of time here. But this is just coming from YouTube. Doc Barkley had his helps conference last week, and this is one of the videos from that. So, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for the opportunity to sow. And, Father, I even thank you for the opportunity to be equipped tonight from a gift that you have given us in this church. Help us to receive everything he has to say, and may your will be done in our lives. We surrender to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm right. I love you. God for the gifts and talents that he has put in us. Everybody say, that would be me. Would be me. And just to clarify, every single Christian everywhere has been called by God. If you're born again, you're gifted by God. And then it is not only the expectation of God that you live for him, but... Uh, it's actually the mandatory, uh, you know, command of God that you and I serve him with what he's given us. Give me an amen on that, please. Amen. You won't scare me if you say amen once in a while. Right. Amen. it would be all right. We're also an amening church. Amen. I'm in Matthew 25. Help us, Lord Jesus. We'll teach a little bit and then we'll see where the Lord takes us. We'll receive our offering a little bit later, and we, I don't know. We'll just kind of go with God. That's kind of what I do. Matthew 25, if you're there, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Everybody say, his goods. His goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, hmm, or his own ability, and straightway took his journey, 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. That's quite a return. I wish our stock market could do this. <laughs> 17, and likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. Not, not by wishing, guys. But he that had received one, verse 18, went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Huh. Huh. It wasn't visible. It wasn't accessible like some people tonight that didn't bother to come to the meeting. Wonder what they're doing. 19, and after a long time, the Lord of those service, servants cometh and reckoned with them. Stop and look up here. I'm here to tell you tonight that every one of us have a reckoning coming. Nobody will escape it. You will meet your maker and it probably won't be so pretty for most people. 
Everybody say a reckoning. A reckoning. It's coming to me. It's coming to me. Hmm. That's an interesting take for a ministry of helps conference. Verse 20. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. Hmm. He, he really put that to work, didn't he? His Lord said unto him, Well done. Everybody shout, Well done. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I love that verse. Amen. 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, or take a look, I have gained two other talents besides them. So here's another guy. He did something with what he was given. He, he, he multiplied it. It was visible. It was seen. It was presentable. 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Everybody shout, Well done. Well done. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. We're looking pretty good. We're looking pretty good here. If these are our friends, fellow servants, fellow disciples. They're making all of us look pretty good. And it's looking pretty good for them because they're getting to enter into the joy of the Lord. That's talking about their lifestyle. 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. A strict man. So is your God. This sloppy, agape, little prissy little Jesus that everybody teaches is not in your Bible. I don't know where they got their, their little stuff from. Amen. I knew that thou art a hard man or strict, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. 25. And I was afraid. Hmm. And went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Mm. Uh oh. The word wicked here or slothful here means lazy. Say lazy. lazy. Don't say it to anybody, but look around right now while you say it. Just look around and say lazy. <laughs> Give it that look like I'm disgusted with you. Look, don't look at me. <laughs> look around at others and just say, lazy. Nothing but lazy. You're not saying they're lazy. I told you that. 27, thou also therefore have put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming, I should have received my own with usury. Now you got to pay attention to verse 28. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I hope you got your interpreter working on that one. Because some people think they're their own God. They got it made in the shade and come and go when they want to. Come to church when they want to. Read their Bible when they want to. Now they're saying don't tie, don't attend church. Let's just do what we want to. Let's just do what we want to. Someone ought to read this verse to themselves. Verse 30. Ca and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you have any idea where that might be? Is there any other Bible verses that use the term wailing or gnashing of teeth? Yes. A place called... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on a second. Doc, are you trying to tell us 
that if we don't put our talents to work the way the Lord expected, we could end up being the unprofitable servant and actually not only that which we have be taken away from us, but we could end up the Lord given a command into outer darkness. Could we really go to hell? It's a question. It's a question. Answer it for yourself in your own studies. Could a human being really go to hell because they did not use what God gave them properly? Amen. Well, I would say according to the verses I read you, this could be possible. I mean, the Lord didn't say naughty. He didn't say, I'll never trust you again. I'll never, I'll never give you another thing. I'm sure that's the case, but he didn't say that. What did he say? The rest of the, whoever was with him, take that servant who did nothing with what I gave him and cast him out into outer darkness where there will be weeping, wailing is, is, is how one verse says, and gnashing of teeth, eternal damnation Amen. out of negligence. I'm going to let that set on us a minute because some people, they're so convinced that no matter what they drink, smoke, eat, cuss, talk, who they run around with, skip church, lay down their Bible, hate each other, live in unforgiveness, that they're still A-OK -okay, and they're going to heaven because we're saved by grace. Well, if you're not saved by grace, you're not saved. But I think uh, maybe we, it wouldn't hurt to read some of these other red letters. I can see now, the longer I go, preaching, you've been doing this a long time, the longer I go, I can see now why some preachers, teachers, pastors, they don't want you to read red letters. Yeah. The, what I just read you goes totally against. They're sloppy living, they're nasty, dirty living. It goes totally, so the more red letters I read, the more I see, well, I get it now. That's why they don't want us to preach this. That's why they don't want you to read it because they're teaching something totally opposite. Uh, by the way, what does the red ink mean? Oh, so when you hear a preacher, teacher, pastor, whoever, speak contrary, teach contrary to the red letters, get it straight. They are teaching opposite or in contradiction to the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's a fact. And I just don't believe that you and I dare live like that in the last of the last days. You know, they say if, if, a, if, a, if your pastor teaches or preaches and it makes you uncomfortable, they call it condemnation. Yeah. I just call it uncomfortable. Yeah. But then I had real dads in the faith. Amen. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Brother Sumrall one time asked me, Dr. Sumrall, he said, Mark, when you preach, do people laugh? I said a little bit once in a while. Do they cry? I said, yeah, a little bit once in a while. Do they get, do they get like energized and happy? I said, yeah, yeah, once in a while. Do they ever just get mad? I said, yeah, more than once in a while. <laughs> he said, son, that is good preaching. <laughs> and I said, really? He said, good preaching is like being on a roller coaster at the little museum park. There's that time you don't have to hang on to nothing. There's another time that you say, look, ma, no hands. Then a few minutes later, it's like, oh my God, where's my mother? <laughs> Everybody say, that's good preaching. Pray that your pastor rattles your cage. Pray that your pastor makes you angry with the word of God, because that's your flesh. Pray that your pastor deals with your flesh so often that you got to get prayed up before you come to church. Say, who knows where he's going today, but I'm sure he's going to include me in the slaughter. That's good pastor. That's good pastor. I was preaching for John Rosicci. He's one of my long, long time preaching friends. And uh, I was illustrating with one of his guys about pastors. Our, our, one of our great anointings is as a pebble popper. Hirelings don't pop your pebble. That's right. They don't care about you. A good sheep, you come in limping and a pastor sees that, 
Are you kidding me? I'll use, uh, I'll use Reverend here. He'll grab that hoof, man. He'll get his tool out. You'll be yelling and screaming and kicking because it hurts. And he'll pop that pebble out and let you go. And, and it's all inflamed and red. And he knows if that stays in there, the wolf's going to get you. It's going to slow you down. You're going to fall behind. The wolf can tell there's a wound and you're becoming prime food for the bad guy. But a good pastor can't, he can't help himself. She can't help himself. I'm just telling you, we don't make it up. But a hireling probably doesn't even have the tool. He just lets you limp along. I'm, I'm not talking about your foot now. I'm talking about your life. A hireling preacher, a money, 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 money only preacher. They don't care about you. They're not going to, they're not going to take the risk that you say, ouch, when they grab it and that you wiggle. And, and I mean, after all, you might not come back. If you don't come back, you don't bring any money. And so why would they pop a pebble? Then the, Jesus talked about the wolves coming. John 10, 10. This is what that text means. Especially any of you preachers that went to theology school, I'm sure you studied this in the biblical language. We're not talking about a wolf like a, just a dog wolf in the woods coming to eat a lamb. We're talking about what I just said. The infection, the inflammation, the pussing, and the bleeding in your life is what attracts the bad human to you, right. the demonic forces to you. And if you don't let your pastor fix you, then the wolves will come. Like Jesus said, a good shepherd will drive the wolf and protect you. Yeah. But a hireling preacher will do nothing. In fact, he'll probably run because yeah. you don't mean anything to them. I'm preaching pretty good for... You can at least say ouch or something. Thank you. Wow. Listen, and he flew all day, so wow. Here's another verse. For, can you handle another verse? Yeah. Romans chapter 14. Yeah, we're just kicking off the conference with some soft, milk toasty preaching. I don't know. Jeremy, I think it was Dr. Johnson. Uh, Keith Johnson, we, I made a comment like that, and he said, Doc, you have never preached anything milky in your life. You don't even know how to do it. You don't even know how to sop the bread, man. Just preach it. <laughs> Romans 14, and let's look at verse 10. Are you ready? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Let's just, I mean, the text is good, but because of time, we're going to grab it. But why dost thou judge thy neighbor... Or why dost thou set at not thy neighbor? For, you better pay attention. For we shall. That's the strongest word in the English language, shall. It's almost as if it's done. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh-oh. May so say, that will be me. Now, it's another message for a different time. If you want to study it out, you can get my message on eternal judgment. And I will explain to you thoroughly, biblically, the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment and who goes to each one and what happens there. You, Christian, if you're, if you're still walking with God and you're not apostate when the Lord appears, you will go to the judgment seat of Christ. You should study about what's going to go on there. Why are we going there? I thought we were saved by grace. You mean there's an accountability? You mean I have to face the maker? You mean I, I got to face Jesus one day? I mean, at, not, at a, not at a mercy seat, a judgment seat, a judge's seat. And there's no escaping that. Even someone as handsome and as great as Mark Barclay is going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. Look with me to 2 Corinthians by the way, is Romans in the New Testament? Yes. Oh, so we're not talking about the Mosaic Law. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Just for the record, you're losing your enthusiasm rapidly. <laughs> this is like a fuel line off in your car. You won't have any gas left in a few minutes if you don't do something. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're just going to look at a, I don't know, maybe just one verse. It's all so good. For we, that's New Testament Christians, book of Corinthians. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Might as well say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. <coughs> You're going to get judged, friends, so am I. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. Oh, I want to preach on that a while. Go ahead. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So your good works and your bad works are all going to be revealed at the judgment seat when your life is reviewed by your master who purchased you. You are not your own according to this New Testament. You have been purchased by Jesus Christ. You should walk like him, talk like him, obey him, do his bidding for him. And, uh, or else. Everybody say or else. Or else. Wow. This is, th th some of this has not been preached in so long. I feel like I'm in the 1950s and I wasn't even a preacher then. Why is this written to one of the most spirit-filled churches flowing in the Holy Ghost? Nine gifts of the Spirit are there. Apostolic authority is there. And it's this church that he writes to. Look at verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. What? I thought he was loosey-goosey. I thought he didn't care how you lived. I thought there's no accountability, no repercussion. I thought, see, there's a term, it goes deeper than this, but there's a term called antinomianism and Martianism. If you're a theologian, if not, just stick with me a second, it's okay. In the heart of that, and we hear this preached today, it's very sad. They literally don't say it, but they're, kind of, but they're saying it. The God of the Old Testament was mean. He was out of control. He killed everything and everybody, which he kind of did. <laughs> Didn't he? The one thing for sure, you don't want your family that has anything that ends in a night <laughs> or work for someone who his company ends in a night, like a Jebusite, a Malachite, Hittite, and other ites. Say, thank God, no whites in my family. <laughs> but they literally teach that, he, that that God was a mean God. He was out of control. And everything from the last verse in Malachi all the way to Genesis, they claim is the law. That's how biblically ignorant they are. And many of them are very famous preachers. But it's not. The prophets are in there. The poetical books are in there. The historical book. In fact, the law is like one book, maybe a book and a half of your entire Old Testament collection. The rest has little to do with the law. But now we're being taught. I, I haven't forgot we're in a ministry of helps conference. Now we're being taught that anything from Genesis to Malachi is Old Testament, Old Covenant. It's the law of Moses and we should not do it. And you don't have to do it, they, they say. I've heard them preach it. You, you, you probably heard them preach it. They say that Jesus came and they present it as if God got saved. This mean God got saved and now he's such a softy that he just doesn't care how you live. He sent his only begotten son so he doesn't care if you mock him and spit on his cross and take your life and claim that you're grateful to be saved but just keep spitting in his face. That's what they teach. They don't say it quite as blunt as I do. So you got to peel back a little bit of the frosting to get into the cake to see there's, that there's maggots in there. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, when we start to consider these things, wait a minute, wait a minute, hang on. God didn't get saved. 
the Bible says in the New Testament that God is God, Old and New Testament. There's no two gods. He didn't get converted. He didn't go to a new Jesus class to learn how to be sweet. The Apostle Peter said, he is still a God of a consuming fire. Amen. The Holy Spirit just said to us here, this God is a God of terror. You better not cross his ways. Now, I've seen people cross his ways all my life. I was listening um, to um, Dr. Kenneth E. Hagen. He's in heaven, but I've been, I've been just kind of studying something he was teaching on a little series. And he started telling stories in this series of people he actually knew that became born again, water baptized, spirit filled, some called to preach. And he started telling how they ignored their gift, treated it like trash, and how they just didn't serve God, though they knew God. And he started telling how they ended up. How that person ended, crashed and burned. How, what happened to that family? Took a little while, he said. They crashed and burned. And he started telling these stories about people he actually knew that were born again. They did go to church. They did get in the ministry of helps. I'm, I'm, pause. The ministry of helps is not part of the church you sign up for. And the people who don't do anything claim they're not in the ministry of helps. You didn't learn that in any good church from any real pastor because it's not true. Whether you excuse this ugly word, volunteer or not, show up or not, that does not mean you're off the hook. You are born again. You are gifted by God. We are all able ministers of the New Testament. New Testament says, the New Testament says, we are all in the ministry of reconciliation. All of us, not just some of us who come out to do something. So the rest of you, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, to a God who's still a God of terror, and he's still a God of a consuming fire, and your good and your not so good works are going to show up, I wonder how that's going to turn out for you or me because no man's exempt from what we're talking about right now well you know brother Barclay you're like you're, you're, you're just kind of putting this pressure on me no I'm not no I'm not I'm preaching you know what you get to do throw it away go home and forget I, you were ever here and I'll see you on judgment day you will Oh, see, we can't get into this. Don't lead me there. Listen to me. But this might ring a bell in at least half of you here in my voice yeah. that has studied your Bible. I'm not going to cuss now. I don't cuss. And I don't use slang. So stick with me. Here it is. Submit. <laughs> and obey. Yes. Who? Yes. Pardon me? Who? Oh, thank you, Pastor, Reverend. Those submit and obey those who have the rule over you. Oh, golly gee, Gomer. <laughs> Jesus Christ put people in authority to hold the ruler, the stick, the measuring instrument over us. So we can see how we're doing. Yes. Not a ruler like a king and you're a peon, a, a stick, a measuring, a thermometer, a barometer, uh, you know, so that that pastor comes out, it's his duty. And he lines out, this is what God said. This is what God wants. Now submit to the rule. Not, not the rule like the law, the measurement. The measurement. It's real good. And so, I just think, we live in such a time that the Lord is coming so fast, so quick. Amen. You do know this, because I know uh, you got good pastors. Uh, there's nothing in your Bible predicted that has to take place between right now and the manifestation that we call the rapture. I call it the last appearance of Christ. There's nothing in there. It's all been fulfilled. I could not tell you, neither could your pastor tell you why he's not here yet. But I think being 
everything's been accomplished, it would probably be a really good time for Mark Barkley to really get his act together and make sure I'm not only ready, but I'm listening for the trumpet blow. This would be a really good time, Barclay, to make sure you're reporting for duty. You're in the house of God. You're in your Bible. You're forgiving everybody. You're worshiping your God. Your head's right with God. Your mouth's right with God. Your heart's right with God. Your money's right with God. Uh, amen. Because we're, we're that short. You mean, Pastor Mark, that when your people go to the judgment seat of Christ, you will be there? We'll give it a count. Oh, and not only present, thank you, Rev, but give an account. What? Yeah. That's right. That's how important this is. That's how much the talent, the permission to function, the gifting that God put in your life, because that parable could talk about money, treasury, what'd you do? Did you build the church with your money? Did you help the poor? It, it's applicable, but almost all Bible scholars that are into theology would tell you that's talking a whole lot more than about a bag of gold. Yes. Yes. A bag of gold. So, well so. So, you, so when I get to heaven and I go to the judgment seat of Christ, John Osteen will be there, my pastor. Yes, you will. <laughs> Billy Falling, my, he, he's in heaven too, but my first pastor's going to be there according to that Bible. Yes. Why are they going to be there? To give an account. Let me, let, me, let me help you. There'll be no lying in judgment seat. There'll be no exaggerating. Right. Nobody's covering for anybody. This is going to be blunt oops. And yes, your pastor, he's going to be there. She's going to be there to give an account. Why? Because they were, just like you said, pastor, they were supposed to submit and obey those that have the rule over them. Those, that's why it says you're, to, you're supposed to love extra. I esteem them very highly in love. Doesn't mean exalt. We exalt Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says, because they're the ones that watch over yep. your soul. Huh. What's your soul? Your thinking center. Your behavior center. Your flavor center. Your decision making center. Your volition. It's all and more. That's what's in your soul. So your, your pastor wasn't called to watch over your body. Come on. You, you yes. are. Your pastor really isn't even called to watch over your spirit man. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit man. Your pastor is called to watch over your soul, your decision making, your emotions, your lust, your wants, uh, on and on and on. Now, we can't do that for you. I mean, but it's our duty to watch over you. So you may have never heard this taught before. This church has. But, but I would say by the behavior, even of a great church like this, I might need to teach this again because I'm not sure they believe it. I really, honest to God, don't think most people believe hell's even an option for them. I pray this, side note, I pray for everybody who hears my voice, especially under my authority, that they would have a string of nightmares about hell, that they would be able to vividly with technicolor, explain to themselves, their family, and anyone else what hell is like. Because yeah. if you don't have that, you won't have a fervency to escape That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. Hell is just a doctrine in your Bible. Wow. I'm preaching pretty good for the... Yeah. This is the first night. If we keep this up, I could get you all in heaven by Friday night. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So, pastor, you have to give an account that you watched over their soul. Right? What's that mean? How did they live their, their, um, their salvation? What'd you do with it? Why would that be important, uh, Doc? Because Satan is also going to be on judgment day, and he's going to accuse you of doing nothing for God. 
that you took everything you had prodigal and you wasted it. You didn't, you didn't honor God with your body, your mouth, your money, your service, your time. You didn't, you raised your kids half world and pagan. Satan's going to be there to challenge you and accuse you of every little bad thing you ever did. This is not the only reason, but this is one of the greatest reasons why you have a pastor saying, shut up, stop doing that. Stop saying that. What on earth are you going there for? And why are you listening to that group? Yeah, amen. That's a good pastor. Because right. we're watching over amen. your decision maker, amen. your wants and lust center. Yes. Not because we're going to boss you around, because on that day when we're called before Jesus Christ, amen. your name will be called. Amen. And then your pastor will be called. You know, it's going to be kind of weird. The person who had 15 pastors. Whoa. <laughs> well, if you, if you were in that church and you were under that pastor and he, he had, he, you know, just because you were passing through, whether you pass through in a month or a year or 10 years, uh, that doesn't eliminate from him from having to give an account. Let's just say you went to, uh, you went there for 10 years and then you left. I don't know why you left. I don't know why anybody leaves, but they left. And so judgment day comes, you, here you are. And for 10 years of your life, you were with this guy. The Lord's not going to say, oh, he's not your pastor now. Don't worry about it. <laughs> No, he's going to say, who washed over this man while he was in this church for 10 years? What about the second pastor? What about the church you split and ripped and lied? I pray every day for some of the motor mouth, sour pusses, backsliders that have left this church. They're not, they got diarrhea of the mouth. They're not even smart enough to shut up. They curse themselves every day when they curse us. And they might want to erase because that's what people do now. They think they can just erase you. <laughs> they have a rude awakening because they may think they erased me and got rid of me, but for the year, 10 years, 20 years yeah. that they, they were in under my authority, yeah. they're going to see my face again. And I am lying for nobody. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. So John gets called up. Who pastored this man? Mark Barkley steps up. I did your honor. How did he do? Horrible. He was nasty. You think you're going to lie? No, you can't. You think you're going to cover up? No. I'll tell you the truth, Jesus. I feel terrible that I failed at being their pastor. They did not listen. They come and went when they wanted to. They treated your house like trash. They lied about me half the time. They stole your tithe. But I told them, I stand before you, King of glory. You know it. You watch everything. I taught on tithing. I taught on forgiveness. I taught on church attendance. I taught on self-discipline. I even taught them how to dress and talk when they're in your presence. But I can't, I can only give you an account. This man poisoned his family. Next, who pastored this guy for these eight years? I did, Your Honor. How were they under your eight years? Nasty, mouthy, strifing, arrogant. Did almost nothing I taught them. We're not accusing you. We have to give an account. This has not been preached in so long uh, across, maybe in your church, uh, uh, that people, they, they think, where on earth did he get this from? To you. Just read it to you. So, what do we got? He wants to tell me they're a chosen one. But being a chosen one usually is based on uh, your response to the call. Many are called. Few are chosen. So, if I've been called out from among them, which I have, and if you're a Christian, so have you. If I've been called out from among them to be separated unto Christ, then I should not be conglomerated with a pagan. I shouldn't be sleeping with a pagan, drinking the pagan's drink, 
talking the pagans talk, tatting the pagans tat, piercing the, ta the, the pagans pierce. I should not be in, in their house, in their bed. I shouldn't be drinking their booze. Uh, you see, why? I've been called out from among them. Yeah. Hold it! Not because I'm the preacher, because I'm a born again Christian. Raise your right hand, say, so am I. So, you know, the Bible says if you judge yourself, then the other judgment either will go away or it won't be so severe. Hmm. So if Mark Barclay was called to be a Christian, Barclay, God said, come out from among them and be separated unto these, unto Christ. And I said, yes, sir, be glad to, been wanting to. That's it? No. No, according to that, every word I ever say after that. Now, whatever you said before the blood, that will probably be never brought up. Amen. Whatever you did before you got saved in heaven on judgment day, it looks like it'll never be brought up. You become a whole brand new creature. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. But from the time you got born again until the time you go to the judgment seat of Christ, you have to give an account. Yeah. Jesus said, and I know why they don't want you reading the red letters. Jesus said, even your very words will be tried and put on trial. Someone asked me, I get a lot of questions. The older I get, the more people ask me questions. They said, uh, what has been one of your driving forces to do what you do? I said, I have a vision of hell and I have a vision of the judgment seat of Christ and it's painted in technicolor from the scriptures. And I plan one day to be at that judgment seat of Christ and I may suffer some loss, but I don't know what at this point of time that, that would cause that. But you know, even your motives, Mark Barclay, so maybe I did some things that I thought I did them for God, but really I did them just thinking that's a promotion. I make more money. I can, I don't know. I try not to be that way, don't you? So I told this group of preachers, this is one of my driving forces. There is no doubt, there is no way Mark Barclay is going to escape the judgment seat of Christ. And George Evans will be there, one of my fathers. Roy Hicks will be there. Lester Summerall will be there. My pastor, John Osteen, will be there. My father in the faith, Hilton Sutton, will be there. And my first pastor, Billy Falling, will be there during whatever years for, to give an account of just how real did they witness. It's a witness, not an accusation. The Lord will say, Dr. Lester Summerall, the years that Mark Barclay submitted to you, which means my family did, unless you have rebellious people of your family, uh, give an account. How did he live? What did he preach? Was he slothful? Was he lazy? Did he take what you gave him and did anything with it? What was his life on the earth worth? And that'll happen to me just like it will you. And I'm not going to stumble into that. I can't think of anything on this planet. I really can't. I can't think of anything on this planet that would be so important that I would lend myself to that. Not a yard, not a herd, not a grove, not a job, not a feral boss. I can't, et cetera. I can't, I just can't, maybe you can. I can't come up with it. I can't. I can't come up with anything in my heart and mind that would say, oh, you can goof off for that. The Lord doesn't care if you say that or do that. He don't care if you report for duty. He don't care. See, I already know. I can tell. There are not only here, but people watching right now streaming. I can already tell somebody say, ah, just condemnation. He's just an old guy. He's talking Old Testament stuff. No, you foolish thing. Listen to me while you get a warning. Amen. Shake yourself. Amen. Do something with yourself. Because the time is coming and it's coming quick. Amen. So many are called. Excuse me. Few are chosen. You're gifted. God has given to every man 
the measure of faith. That's you. You're included. God has set in the church, and then he listed the fivefold ministries listed there. Healing and miracles are, are, uh, are listed there. Yeah. And the ministry of helps is listed there. And God put that in the church. That means you've been placed in the church. You probably, you could buy a car with a radio if you got money. <laughs> but if you didn't have money, your car, Amen. you can get a love song or two going, you know, but so we wanted music. All right. So we had to put that in our car. So now I'm going we to encourage go you to uh, check out your message if you want. The whole conference from last week is on his YouTube channel. We can bring the lights up if you'd like. Um, I will say this, that when I exhorted you from Ephesians 4 before this video happened, I didn't recollect he was going there. <laughs> so there must be a Holy Spirit doing something tonight. And I'll just reference the verse he's talking about out of Hebrews 13, verse 17. It says, To obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account... Let them, let them, those who rule over you, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. That's the verse. That's the verse. So, the whole theme of tonight is we have growing to do. We have, a, we, we have a life that we have to give an account for. We have a responsibility to tur stir up the talents and the gifts, the giftings on the inside of us. We have a responsibility to be an active, producing member of the body of Christ that's doing our part so that the whole body is functioning, growing, thriving, maturing. And if not... Man, we're going to stand before God and give an account for what did we do with our life? What did we do with our words, with our time, with our money? Is our life really representing Jesus Christ to those around us? Are we actively pursuing being a disciple and making disciples? Because the Bible is very plain that just to paraphrase it, I guess, that the sum of our life is going to be kind of pushed into a pile and lit on fire. And everything that's made from wood, hay, stubble is going to burn. And anything that you've done that has any value to it to the kingdom of, for the kingdom at all is going to remain. That gold, silver, precious metals, jewels. Those are the good things that we're doing for the kingdom. It's time to begin to self-evaluate and really ask yourself, what am I doing for the kingdom? What am I doing to contribute to the body of Christ? To get this eternal mindset going inside of us, because again, we're running out of time here. Jesus is coming quickly. We're going to be standing before that seat pretty quickly here. Now's not the time to be sitting on the bus bench waiting for the ride. Now more than ever, we need to be on double time advancing the kingdom because the time is short. You don't have much time left to make a difference. The reward is going to be based about on that. We got to have this mentality that not only is heaven and hell real and what we do here determines which place we go, but what are we doing when we get there? See, we're going to have assignments in heaven where we're ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ and how faithful you were now determines what you're going to be doing then in this ruling and reigning with Jesus. And if you haven't been faithful in little, you're not going to have much there. We have got to get eternally minded and begin to pursue whatever this says activated in our lives wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly, I'm going to run after Jesus Christ because I am running out of time. You see it? Now more than ever is not the time to be doing this to the gifts that God has set in your life who are trying to equip you. And that's not the cross of Christ. That's saying, I reject you. <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> it's not time out either, no. Understand? God loves you enough to, try to, to place you in a body, and to set giftings over you, to, to help you, to be all you called to be. You need to, you need to run after it. You receive it? 
All right, Father, I do love you, and I thank you for the opportunity to hear a word, Lord, from my pastor tonight. I thank you, Father, that it penetrates the ground of our hearts and gives birth to life and light on the inside, Father, and helps us to run after you with more zeal and more passion than ever before. In these last days, Father, may we be consumed with the call of Jesus Christ. May we be consumed with the thought of eternity with you forever in that judgment seat and the reality of heaven and hell. And not just keeping ourselves out of hell, but doing everything in our power to reach out to the lost and drag them with us, even if it means kicking and screaming. Help us, Father, to pursue you, to run after you, to take ground for you in your kingdom. Tonight, Father, may we set some things straight in our minds, our hearts, our emotions, once and for all, those things that have been binding us, blockading us, and stopping us from moving forward in you, hindering us. May we determine to pull those things out in the name of Jesus. We give you thanks and praise for it now. You agree with that? Say amen. All right, I love you. Grace and peace.